Hi, everyone. Thanks uh, for coming. Really excited to get uh, tonight's session up and running. Uh, my name is Jose. I'm a alum of the DOPHC program at Michigan State uh, University and I'm currently a postdoc at SUNY Albany and I'm applying to pediatrics um, this year like many of our participants and we're really excited to have this phenomenal group of folks uh, on. I'll just have my two other trainee co-hosts um, give themselves a shout out as well. Hi, I'm Jenny. Um, I am a uh, G1 um, in the Columbia MD-PhD program, um, and I work on the virtual content committee in APSA. Alex. Hi, everyone. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm a representative from Future Pete's Press, and I will be your moderator tonight. Great. Let's see if this works. We're brought again by the electric team. But I don't know if you guys heard that, but that was Elmo. And so he had a lot of different organizations that uh, has helped out with tonight, tonight's session. But one of the common themes is they got the letter P in there for pediatrics. So um, or physicians uh, in the American Physician Scientists Association. So um, uh, I'm uh, representing APSA. I'm one of the past presidents of APSA. Um, so we're a trainee organization that uh, supports the needs of uh, physician scientist trainees across the country, MD, DO, with or without a PhD. And so um, I'll link in the chat all the different organizations that have contributed uh, to tonight's session. Um, and you guys can... Uh, check those out. Um, uh, Future Peds Res, it's uh, uh, started in 2020, um, and their trainee organization really focused on helping uh, pediatric appl applicants connect with program directors. Um, and so they've been a great help to sort of demystify the application process for pediatric applicants. Um, I also wanted to highlight some of the other organizations that helped us recruit our panelists. So we have the National uh, pediatric Scientists Collaborative Working Group. Um, and so uh, they are sort of leaders uh, and, and program directors in these specific uh, research training programs that get together and talk about these issues. We have the Society of Pediatric Research, um, so this Society of Researchers in Pediatrics. We have the um, Association of Medical School Pediatric Department Chairs. I always mess that one up, but it is what it sounds like. It's chairs of different pediatric departments. Um, and then Future Peds Res um, also uh, collaborates with the Council on Medical Student Education in Pediatrics and the Association of Pediatric Program Directors, or APPD. Um, so we're really lucky to have sort of a rock star uh, group of folks putting this together and getting the right information for applicants. So tonight we really have three goals. One is to educate folks about the different options in uh, research during pediatrics residency, answer your questions with some of our panelists um, who, again, are rep not only ex spectacular pediatricians in their own right and specialists, but in doing research, uh, but also taking time and effort to lead these uh, efforts nationally. And then at the, we'll take a short time to transition to having specific program directors tell you about their programs and uh, what are what's unique about uh, their specific institution. Um, so with that, I'll introduce Dr. Satlin, who's gonna get us started with the first part of the session. Um, and I'll note that I'll be very brief with our introductions. We're gonna share bios with everyone. And as I mentioned before, everyone's um, spectacular in their own right and even leading uh, nationally in these issues. So Dr. Lisa Satlin, MD is the Herbert H. Lehman Professor of Pediatrics, and she's the chair at the Jack Louis Clark Department of Pediatrics at the Iken School of, uh, of Medicine in Mount Sinai. Uh, she's the chair for the research committee for the American Medical Student Pediatric Department Chairs, and also one of our board members for the American Physician Scientists Association. So Dr. Setlin. Great, thank you so much, Jose. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen and um, give you a um, brief overview um, 
of, oops, there we go, of the um, training opportunities during residency. Um, uh, I don't know how many of the attendees um, participate in a similar um, webinar that um, Jose had organized, I think it was last year, um, but these slides have been updated to some extent. Um, so um, the goal, as I think, I don't have to tell this group, oops, um, of all of the pediatric physician scientist training programs is to really develop this next generation of pediatric physician scientists, which is, you know, really quite a rare breed at this point. There are um, many different types of programs, and we're going to go over some of those, but the uh, elements that may be in, that are typically included are certainly mentorship by scientists, physician scientists, and physicians, um, personalized scholarly oversight committees, workshops, courses, seminars on career development and scientific concept, concepts, small grant funding for research, and then um, many programs offer the opportunity to complete the IRP, we'll talk about what these acronyms mean, ARP, or traditional residency training programs. There is a list of pediatric physician scientist training programs at the um, site um, with a link here. And um, this uh, slide set will be distributed after um, the presentation, so you can all take a look at that. So um, the American Board of Pediatrics um, has approved a few non-standard pathways for training in pediatrics. So typical pediatric subspecialist training includes, as I'm sure most of you know, three years of residency and three years of fellowship. And two of those fellowship years can be pretty much devoted to research. But to streamline and foster physician scientist training, while very what's critical is ensuring clinical competency, the American Board of uh, Pediatrics offers two pathways to residents who are truly committed, I'm sorry, to academic careers as physician scientists. And these include the IRP or the integrated research pathway and the ARP, the accelerated research pathway. Overall, as I'll show you in the next slide, the pathways do not reduce the overall length of training time, but what they do accomplish is they provide additional time devoted to research. Um, they differ in the content of general pediatrics training, the length of general pediatrics and fellowship training, and the time to eligibility for certifying exams. I would urge all of you um, at any point to please go to the American Board of Pediatric website for any for details about the pathways I'll present. So this is a table that I put together that sort of you know compares the different pathways. What you're looking at here are the requirements um, in terms of um, the um, elements for the standard training pathway the one I just described of three years of residency and three years of fellowship training, the integrated pathway and the accelerated research pathway. And then we're also gonna talk about some specialty fast tracking. So again, standard training um, includes, um, again, these um, this division of labor in terms of residency and fellowship. Um, there's no American Board of uh, Pediatrics pre-approval for any uh, of these um, trainees. Um, after three years of Gen Peds training, you are eligible to take the General Peds certifying exam, six years to take the um, subspecialty certifying exam. No prerequisites, and yes, scholarly work um, is required. Now, the integrated research pathway includes three years of general pediatric, quote unquote, residency training, but this includes two years of two clinical years and one research year. Um, the trainee then goes on to um, subspecialty fellowship training, which is anywhere from two to three years. Um, but for this pathway, the trainee must, must get approval from the American Board of Pediatrics to pursue this pathway no later than the first nine months of the PGY1 year. The years of training 
for eligibility to take the general peds exam is variable and we'll talk a little bit more about that and um again for uh for subspecialty training you have to complete your fellowship to sit for those boards the prerequisites for this pathway include uh, completing a PhD or an equivalent strong research experience. And of course, for all of these pathways, and I won't even comment again, scholarly work is required. Now the accelerated research pathway is a little different. Two years of comprehensive clinical training and then a transition into subspecialty fellowship training. There is no board approval um, required for the typical peds of specialties, but yes, for allergy immunology. And the, again, years to training, um, years of training for eligibility to take the general peds exam are variable based on competency. Oh, I'm sorry, again, uh, based on the competencies achieved during the gen peds training. Um, and again, six years are required of training to sit for the subspecialty boards. Um, we'll talk more about subspecialty fast tracking, but um, what this pathway does, um, you, the trainee finishes three years of general peds training, goes into subspecialty fellowship training, which is um, cut by one year. So it's only two years of fellowship training for the fast tracking. Um, there is a requirement for board approval. And um, the requirement here or prerequisite is that there has been a major research accomplishment prior to fellowship. So um, just a few more comments about these, the accelerated and the integrated pathways. Um, again, when do you make the decision to pursue these? Um, for the accelerated pathway, the um, uh, trainee has to make the decision no later than nine months into R1, which is the first postgraduate year or PGY1, in order to plan for the second year curriculum. And again, eligibility for the Gen Peds exam occurs after two years of general Peds plus that additional year, the clinical experience during the subspecialty fellowship. So again, basically um, three clinical years. For the integrated, the IRP pathway, again, approval of the board, from the Board of Pediatrics is necessary before beginning residency training or during and no later than the first nine months of the first PGY1 year. And eligibility to sit for the GenPeds exam um, occurs after three years of the IRP and whatever other clinical experience is required. There are, um, you again, go to the ABP um, pathway site where you can learn a lot more about that. I'm sorry, my computer is moving very quickly. So just to compare what these might look like in terms of the training period, and there is variability here. I'm gonna state that from the outset. This is just a lovely little um, timeline that is um, posted on the Duke Pediatric Research Scholars Program. Um, what you um, see here is the categorical pathway, um, PGY-1, and then there is some research time. You do have elective time, PGY-2 and PGY-3. By PGY-4, you are in fellowship training. For the IRP, again, you know, for this one, a research in orange is really built into the entire training period. I bet I have to stop touching this. Okay. Um, now, just for the fast tracking pathway, again, this allows fellows who've demonstrated a major accomplishment in research to apply for a one year waiver of training, the scholarly year during fellowship. So that reduces the overall time to training from six to five years. Um, the evidence of research accomplishment might include a PhD degree or sustained research achievement relevant to that specialty or career path. And again, the um, uh, uh, program director of, um, for this training must petition the American Board of Pediatrics Subboard um, to waive the requirement for scholarly activity. The, any, the trainees who do enter subspecialty training via the accelerated research pathway cannot be eligible for fast tracking. 
So, you know, how do you decide which one of these pathways you might want to pursue? And there are a number of factors, and I hope that we can have some discussion, you know, about uh, additional um, factors. But first is the time in training and the financial occur uh, concerns of extended training. Um, you know, I'm sure many on the call are in, you know, M our MD, uh, PhD trainees. So your training is extended to begin with. And you have to just decide how much, you know, how much more training do you need? The other consideration for those of us who, are, you know, are so eager to pursue um, careers in research is, you know, um, what is the time interval between your, you know, the, the the true research experience and the pace of discovery in the field. Because as we all know, the pace of discovery is really quite rapid. So, um, you know, for example, for an MD PhD who does their uh, graduate years, um, you know, in the middle of training, by the time they get back to the research world, the field has moved ahead considerably. And again, you want to um, consider what is the balance of clinical and research time within the subspecialty field. There are some subspecialty uh, subspecialties that do require a considerable amount of clinical skills, technical skills. For example, you know those that have an interventional component or neonatology, whereas other um, cognitive specialties um, can provide uh, a lot more research time. So um, the other um, new um, player on the horizon are these STAR programs. Um, uh, and I'm going to describe um, the STAR programs in general terms. Um, and again, there is so much information about every one of these pathways. So please um, uh, you know, click on the link when you get the slides if you want to learn more about it. I'm sure many of you have STAR programs at your institutions. But again, the same purpose as all of the um, programs that we're already talking about. Um, you know, the NIH very much wants to help recruit and retain outstanding physician investigators. And the goal of the STAR program is to accelerate the transition of residents to subsequent research and career development. So the STAR programs are, um, the STAR program is a mechanism that it supports an institutional program. It's not given to a single person. It's given to an institution to provide outstanding mentored research opportunities that are designed for resident investigators, so residents, to engage in research projects with experienced investigators for a minimum of one year and a maximum of two contiguous years during residency training. This program is, applies only to trainees who are currently in residency training. So maybe, you know, um, you're, you're, if you're unsure about what you want to do, you know, you go into residency and then think about applying to this pro program. There are now um, a number of NIH institutes that are offering STAR programs, NHLBI, N NCI, uh, and I mean, you can see the rest with uh, National Eye Institute, um, the most recent um, institute to offer STAR um, grants. Um, the support that you get or the resident investigator gets is for 80%. So this one is a little different because now the NIH is supporting the salary um, for during residency for a minimum of a year of research and again, a maximum of two during residency training. Um, there are supplementary research and professional developmental act development activities that are offered. Um, there are dollars for research supplies, technical support, um, uh, dollars for registration and uh, for short-term courses or workshops. Um, the um, uh, trainees enrolled in this program participate in workshops on oral and written communication um, of research and grant writing. Um, travel is provided for scientific conferences and NIH-sponsored workshops. So, you know, there's a lot of um, meat and career development opportunities built into these programs. Um, I'm not going to go through all of the details here, but you can, you know, see at the top there the research and residency programs, some of the elements that are included. I've touched on many of these already. 
Um, same thing for the research and career development um, uh, opportunities. And um, the um, again, the goal is to provide skills for transition to independent K award um, or foundation type awards um, at the conclusion of training. So what does this look like compared to the categorical and the integrated pathways that I've shown you already? Um, this is again, Duke's, oh, I'm sorry, Duke's Pediatric Scholars Program. I will tell you that the one we have here at Mount Sinai is not four years, it is three years. So um, don't, this is just an example. Um, but again, you can see that research in orange is built in to the um, STAR pathway um, at Duke. Um, again, you don't, um, for P, this, this is what they have for Duke's internal medicine program. Um, but again, pediatric pathways, the pediatric programs can do this in three years. So um, finally, what I'd like to just spend a few minutes on is the Pediatric Scientist Development Program, the national um, NIH funded program specifically for pediatric um, uh, aspiring pediatric sciences. Um, the director of this program is Sally Permar, who is professor at w uh, Weill Cornell Medical um, School. Um, I have been very involved in this program for a very long time. Um, I was I chaired their evaluation committee for quite a number of years. I was on their steering committee, and they recently sent me off to Canada to be on the Canadian um, equivalent of this. But let me describe this to you because it's a fabulous program. Um, the mission is the same you've already heard um, about, and um, I won't, you know, I don't have to reread that. But this is a collaboration, a very long-standing collaboration between NICHD and AMSPDEC. So Jose, that is the acronym. That's how you say it, AMSPDEC. Um, and this relationship has been ongoing since 1987. Um, you can see the um, grant that supports this program was just renewed for years 39 to 43. And this is a program that, again, supports very diverse early stage pediatric scientists that are pursuing a wide variety of uh, types of research. Um, again, the um, program is supported by AMSPDEC, but in addition, you can see all the other um, societies that also support this program, um, including the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, March of Dimes, Burroughs Welcome, as well as those pedi pediatric societies that are listed there. Um, the um, goals, uh, again, I'm not going to repeat all this, but what this program provides, oh, I'm sorry, are three years of mentored research training with 80 to 100% protected research time. Um, this program um, is targeted to fellows, um, to prepare fellows for research careers in academic peds. And um, what they are looking for is diversity, diversity in terms of disciplines, backgrounds, and academic institutions. The way this, um, if you were to apply to this program, <clears throat> your funding would look as follows. They are, um, the scholars um, in their um, first year of the program, the funding has to be supported by your home institution. Um, in year two, um, the um, trainee transitions to NIH funding of 82,000 in salary and then fringe, same thing for year three. So this is a three-year commitment um, where your chair and your home institution has to be totally on board because they're gonna support that first year. Um, in addition, the trainee gets 20,000 in research funds and then travel support in years two and three. Um, new is that the scholars can have the option of taking this award to another institution um, in their third year. Um, so, what is the eligibility to even apply? The candidates must be completing or have completed a pediatric residency in the United States or Canada and be pursuing a pediatric subspecialty fellowship. 
So, you know, this is, um, again, beyond residency. This is, this is a program that's, again, targeted to, you know, sort of those residents who've decided sort of late that they want to do research um, or even, you know, um, uh, you know, during their fellowship. Um, pediatricians with any of those degrees um, can apply. And again, there is, um, as of this year, there are new expanded eligibility criteria that will include those who wish to pursue research later in fellowship. So a PGY-4, so a first year spe subspecialty fellow can apply as long as they are guaranteed two full years of research, 80% effort, 15 months after the application is due. So again, this is a program that's particularly um, may be very attractive to, you know, sort of the late bloomers, those who decide later on that they want to do research. There is tremendous mentorship built into the PSDP. There's a local scientific mentor for the research. There are external career mentors um, from the PSDP steering committee. I can't tell you, I'm an external career mentor um, for PSDPs and it's so much fun to, um, you know, uh, see these individuals um, uh, transition um, through, you know, their training. Um, and of course, there's um, institutional mentorship from the pediatric department chair. Typically, the chairs are very involved at the um, institution. And of course, there are lots of interactions for the um, PSDP scholars with the um, leadership of the PSDP, the steering committee, um, AMSPDEC and um, others who attend the annual AMSPDEC meeting. The track record for PSDPs um, in terms of achieving NIH funding is really spectacular. Um, if you first look to the left here, this is a graph showing total NIH funded and K award recipients overall that um, NIH funded PIs, um, you can see about 54% um, of them um, have Ks, 54% um, uh, are K awarded, uh, K, K awardees. And then, uh, I'm sorry, the 54% of all of these um, training of these individuals have Ks. But now look at PSTPs. Um, the conversion rate for converting from a K08, a K23, or a K99 to an R series is a, award is about 63%. It's really, really high. And then um, the scholars' um, conversion rate um, to an R01 specifically is about 48%. So these trainees do really, really well. Um, you know, essentially, um, you know, with about at least half of them ultimately transitioning to getting R01 funding. So um, if you were interested in this, you'd apply uh, as a PGY3 or a PGY4. Please, I'm not, we're not going to go into the other details here, but basically you want to just um, visit the website to get the details about this. Um, Sally and Janet would be happy to answer any questions that you have. The website is there as well. So um, that's all I was going to review with you. And I see there's a lot there's a lot in the chat room, um, which I have not looked at. But um, Jose, you'll tell me what we're going to do now. Yeah, great. So now we're um, going to transition to our um, first panel and we'll have um, uh, Jenny's going to take over and moderate. Um, I'll just introduce our panelists quickly and so that'll give uh, everyone an opportunity to answer and uh, ask questions uh, generally about research during residency and that was a ton of information so folks can uh, be reassured that we'll send out those slides and they can have some time to do their research uh, on each of those different options. Um, so just to go alphabetically, we have Dr. Fernando Gonzalez. He's an MD, he's a professor of pediatrics at the University of California, San Francisco, and a neonatologist. Um, he's also the co-chair for the Physician Scientist Development Committee at the Society of Pediatric Research. We have Dr. Audrey Ness. She's an MD-PhD. She's a third-year pediatrics resident uh, 
and the chief resident for the pediatric scientist program at Baylor College of Medicine. Um, and she's applying to genetics and genomics fellowships and interested in cancer genetics. And she was also one of the past presidents of the American Physician Scientist Association. Um, we have Dr. Daniel Moore, who's an MD, PhD, and associate professor of pediatrics, pathology, microbiology, and immunology at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. He's also a pediatric endocrinologist and one of the co-chairs for the National Pediatric Scientist Collaborative Working Group. Um, lots of um, organizations. And of course, we have Dr. Satlin, who I already introduced, who's the chair at Mount Sinai, and she's also the chair of the research committee at um, the at AMSPDEC. So I'll have plenty of time to practice that acronym. Um, and I'm going to pin folks. I'm not sure if it works for everyone. Does that work for everyone or just me? It doesn't look like folks are nodding. So that's an option for you. If you just want to look at our panelists and moderator, you can pin their names and that might be helpful to see who's um, speaking. So I'll, I'll hand it over to Jenny to to moderate our questions. We're going to, we are going to do like one or two questions per panel, or sorry, one or two panelists per question. Um, but if folks have burning answers, um, then feel free to pop in as well. Awesome. Thanks, Jose. Um, and thank you to all the panelists for um, being here and being present to answer um, a lot of burning questions that have been submitted in registration as well as here in the chat. Um, so I wanted to go ahead and start with a question that was submitted uh, in registration, um, which is how do you best prepare to apply to pediatric PSTPs? And do you have to have exposure to pediatric specific research before applying? Um, and I'll hand this question over to Dr. Gonzalez. Can I ask a clarification? Uh, and obviously you didn't write this question, but PSDP meaning the national K-12 that Sally Permar runs or in general physician scientist training programs and residency? I'm assuming it's the latter. I think uh, the latter, just the general, using the PSTP as a general term. Okay, so, that, so that's a great question. And obviously I can only speak to our experience here, but um, a couple things like generally speaking, and I don't know who's called in to this um, talk, but for a lot of the applicants, there's many MD, PhD holders. These are people that have self-identified early on as being interested in this. Um, one thing we're trying really hard to, to do is to recruit people that are just interested in research, but that haven't had much to any experience. So we don't want people to feel excluded because they don't have a first author paper or have worked in a big lab or know exactly what they wanna do. If they're just interested and motivated in doing research um, related to pediatrics, then we we will happily take them into um, into our track. Um, as far as preparing for applications, I you, the, one thing is every program does this differently, but how is it incorporated into the categorical residency? So for us, we have a separate iris number, so it's a separate match from the categorical residency. But for years, it was combined, and so. Most to all of these people have fantastic CVs, you know, with a number of publications and worked in great labs and have previous funding support. But on the categorical side, um, they want to make sure that these people can hack it in residency, um, if, to say it bluntly, meaning so if there's any concern on the, on the clinical performance in medical school, that's a little bit of a red flag. That doesn't mean necessarily that they won't match, but for the people that rank that are, you know, looking at the big picture of you know, working in a community of pediatric residents, um, they want somebody who's solid on that, uh, for that piece. So making sure, so my advice is always when you finish, let's say your PhD or your research portion of your training, that when you go back and do clinical work, that you're focused on the clinical work and you're doing your best to really learn and incorporate that. Because if there's any red flags on that side, then, you know, um, then the people who, who, the ultimate deciders of the rank list, you know, they may, you know, if there's concerns on that end, then then that makes it more difficult to match in the residency. And, you know, I'm oversimplifying to some degree, it's more complicated than that. But that's, so, so my, that's a long answer to a short question. Do your best on the clinical side 
during your training before applying to residency. And so there are no red flags. And if you're just interested in research, then we will consider you and likely take you if, if, you, if you're really motivated to do that. Can I, can I jump in? Um, I'm Corinne Keaton. I'm at the University of North Carolina. The, in terms of the question about how, do you have to have done pediatric research? I think, I think the answer is absolutely not. It, in fact, during um, residency and fellowship, oftentimes pediatric residents will work in labs of people who are not pediatric researchers. And we often encourage that because we want people to have the broad, um, you know, a, a bro, you know, the best research mentors possible. And sometimes those are in pediatrics and sometimes we need to borrow the skills of people who are not pediatric researchers to learn to be the best uh, pediatric researchers we can be. And so thinking about that um, is one, one, you know, to think about places that are, um, have are only children's hospitals versus those that are integrated is, is something to consider about those different, the, the pros and cons of that. Another way to think about the same thing is that all research is pediatric research, right? I mean, I think if you use your creativity a little bit, there's not anything you could have done that's not applicable to children and child's health at, at some level. And, you know, that's like connecting even to what Fernando said. That's kind of what I'm listening for when I interview people is like the story. Like, what have you done? How has it connected you to child research? How do you see it moving you forward? What things are you going to need along the way, whether you've had a lot of experience or a little experience or how the story is going to grow through your participation and through your training in, in our program here. But like all, all, all disease begins in childhood, all research is child health research. You just got to put your story together. Those are great answers. Thank you. Um, I, for this next question, I want to um, bring Dr. Ines into this as a current resident um, because someone asked, what is, what is a day in the life of um, a resident uh, who's also doing a lot of research in pediatrics? Thank you. Um, and I and I brought my APSA mug for the occasion tonight, so I'm happy to be here. Um, so a day in the life, uh, I guess it depends on kind of where you are in your training process. And so as was mentioned in the initial presentation, there are a couple of different tracks that uh, you may pursue as someone who is wanting to be a pediatrician scientist. And typically, regardless of which track you're on, you are going to start out in the clinical space. And that first year is a major adjustment, trying to get used to being an intern and having higher clinical demands and responsibility. However, the benefit of being part of a structured path is that you likely will have some opportunities to engage in the scientific side of your brain as well. So, for example, our program has um, a two-week block in our first year where we get together and have uh, specific didactics uh, related to pediatrician scientist training and also engage in writing a case report. Um, so you still are kind of keeping that that part of you um, alive, although it's not the main focus. And then as you progress further along, um, I'm currently now in my research year where it's predominantly science focused. And I still have continuity clinic where I'll see patients to keep my up my clinical acumen and moonlighting as well. So um, the the focus though shifts. And so it really kind of depends on, on where you're at. I think the biggest thing is just making sure that you have other peers and mentors who can help um, engage in discussions and um, teaching that's pertinent to your goals in the future. And so seeking that out is, is the most important thing. And it's not always going to look the same day to day. Some days you're in the clinic or, you know, on service for 14 hours. Um, other days you have chances to read uh, articles and, and that's kind of a good practice, I think, for life of a pediatrician scientist. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, we have a question about uh, ranking categorical versus these re research specific residency paths, um, if they have 
two different NRMP numbers. Um, so I'll, I'll give this to Dr. Satlin. Um, so I can tell you that for we, our research residency has a separate NRMP number. Um, <clears throat> um, for those individuals who are ranked on the research resident, who um, are, rank, are ranked on the research residency um, track, but are not, do not match, they automatically are considered for the categorical as well. But we tell all of our research residents to also rank um, the categorical program, our categorical program as well. So um, you can rank both. Let's say as a program that only has one match number, we just have the categorical yeah. place and you know we it gives us some flexibility in terms of how many candidates we can collect from year to year. And we just right. haven't really thought it was super important to have a separate match number. Like logistically, it hasn't really mattered to us. Although I, I think candidates sometimes look at that and they think, oh, you don't have a separate match number. You know, you're like maybe not as engaged in <clears throat> physician scientist training, but hopefully, you know, if you visit, we can convince you that that, that not having a separate match number is not a big deal. Awesome, that is very helpful. Um, the next question is, is it okay to be open um, in terms of what research question to pursue and do you need to know what fellowship you intend to do? Um, and I'll pass this to Dr. Moore. Yeah, I love this this question. So I'd say pediatricians like come in I, and I've, I've talked to medicine people, medicine applicants for whatever reason tend to be a lot more like decided before they arrive. And the average pediatric applicant is almost always not fully decided. Like almost all of them have at least two specialties they're considering. And I have met <clears throat> much more than zero candidates who've had six or more specialties they were still considering when they when they applied. My life certainly and, and your life as an interviewee is probably easier the more decided you are because it's a lot easier to connect you to would-be research mentors and division directors and program directors so that you can ask more directed questions the more you know, right? If you know I want to do pediatric endocrinology, then I'll meet with you. I'll talk to you about the program. If you know you want to do one of five different specialties, that's a really hard interview day to arrange. I probably can't have you meet with, with all the mentors and all the different divisions. But what I will ask you if you come that way is like, how are you going to figure it out, right? I mean, that's really sort of the question for me is like, how are these things bouncing around? And, and often it's like your research is connected to a bunch of different areas. And so a lot of places make sense to you. And it, it certainly makes sense to me too. But what we have to figure out together is well, what what is the necessary and sufficient experiences that you're going to need to decide? And then if you want to do like an IRP or something, you've got like nine months to figure it out. Like, I mean, come on now. Uh, the other thing I encourage people, if you're, you feel that way, is like, how can you use medical school right now to, to answer some of those questions? Like, don't wait to residency. Like, you probably have six, eight months more of, of medical school time to go. You're an ND PhD student. You have a lot of electives on the back end. You're mostly like, figure it out now as much as you can so that you can use your time when you get here to answer the rest of the questions. So no, it's not going to really move you around on the rank list too much. But if you have no story and no plan, like that, that's going to hurt me. <laughs> a little bit as your your interviewer but if you have a story and a plan you're thoughtful and you're you're sort of working towards a decision and then we're going to help you with that and we also accept that you might get here with a really strong plan and change your mind like two days later so so we're going to accept that too so our program we're going to interview you really strongly and if you're a good match for one of our fellowships we'll figure you're a good match for the other ones too and the program directors tend to agree with that oh i just wanted to chime in because I was in that exact situation where I changed my mind multiple times throughout residency, and it does happen because you are getting exposure to um, different areas, and not only that, but in a different role, um, and it feels different when you have more responsibility um, in, in those clinical um, spaces. And so uh, I think the important thing, though, is uh, like Dr. Moore was saying, being thoughtful about it and having reflected on who you are, kind of what your future goals are, and at that point in time, what interests you. And so if you come in having, you know, gone through that exercise, that does come across much better than either I don't know or kind of the other way around of being, you know, maybe a bit too closed off to the idea that you still may, 
you know, have more areas that you're going to be exposed to. So just uh, something to keep in mind, just, yeah, having, having a plan and having a story. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, I think I will ask one more question of this panel. And this question is, can you talk about your own specific training path? Um, and, you know, when you reflect back on your path, what are some pros? What were some cons maybe that you found with your specific path to becoming a pediatrician researcher? And I will start with Dr. Satlin. Whoa. Okay. Um, well, I um, <clears throat> actually, I started my training. Uh, I was in college at the time when MD PhD programs were just coming on board. I did not know about them when I was applying to medical school, but I knew I wanted to do research. Actually, it was hard for me to decide whether to do a PhD or an MD. So I did the uh, MD, um, um, decided in my first year of medical school, I wanted to be a nephrologist and um, ended up though deciding on peds much later. During my fellowship, after doing all that clinical time in medical school and the you know clerkships and uh, my fellowship, I realized how much I missed research, and I decided in my second year of fellowship I wanted to be an investigator. Um, I don't have a PhD, but what I did do was I did a four years of fellowship. I elected to do an extra year of fellowship to you know um, take a good number of graduate school courses, um, essentially do sort of like a PhD during fellowship, and really um, you know establish you know myself as an investigator. Um, I got a K or they, there were no Ks back then. It was called the first award. I got that. And um, uh, a long time ago in that grants and it's 30 some odd year of funding at this point. Um, uh, so, you know, the questions have changed. The title hasn't changed, but um, it goes on and on. Um, so, um, <clears throat> you know, for me, it was just a passion for research just from college on. And, you know, I've always, I've always made, you know, research um, a priority in everything that I do. Awesome. Uh, what about you, Dr. Gonzalez? So I, 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 once again, I'm an MD only, and I came late to research and I was completely, these programs that we're talking about, no idea. No idea that people could get MD PhDs, no idea that there were physician scientist training programs, um, or fast tracking or any of this. Even if I'd known that, it wouldn't have changed my course because I would have thought, I thought, oh, that's not for me, right? Um, so I came to research later. Mentorship was huge for my development during fellowship, during my research time. Um, so that enabled, structured mentorship really enabled my success. Um, I. I do want to add, this was kind of the subtext of my answer earlier. You know, there is an issue, um, you know, we can all, we can, people can come to research at any time. Like I said, I'm a late comer to research. So um, just because you don't have that experience doesn't mean, you know, you can't do it or it's not for you. Um, you know, we have an issue of diversity, both gender, especially when we talk about leadership in these sort of research positions and then also race, ethnicity. I talked about it before, a lot of people who know early on they want to do this are people that have had exposure to it and experience with it or have been in a lab or even just aware that these programs exist. And so I think the, the, an objective or task for, for all of us on this side of it, on this side of the panels is, well, how do we broaden that to give, you know, not everybody's going to have the same exposure or experience, but make people aware that these things exist and this is a possibility. It's our job on this side to to train and to mentor and to sponsor and to coach and to do all those things for these people, even if they don't have that experience. So for me personally, that was huge in my development. Once again, it was really primarily the, the direct mentorship I received during fellowship that made a difference. Great, and Dr. Moore? 
Well, these are always good stories. I love hearing about everybody's stories. But uh, let's see, I started on my path to research in 1976. Uh, it was hard to believe which I, when I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, right? So that's the, sort of my story. So I became very interested in that growing up. I got a chance to witness all kinds of evolutions in the medical care for type 1. I went to college with that sort of as an interest, but I was a first-gen college student, so I didn't know anything about any of these programs. I didn't know anybody that knew anything about any of these things either. But I started doing research that seemed like the thing I was supposed to do and got into some programs to the JDRF in the summer. And finally, I started to apply to medical school. Somebody told me that you could be an MD, PhD uh, thing. That sounded really good. So I went to Penn uh, and did that, did my PhD in immunology, working on the immunology of transplant biology and pathogenesis of diabetes. Then I came to Vanderbilt after that as a peds resident. I did a pediatric endocrine fellowship because I knew I wanted to kind of put those things uh, together. I went through the IRP. So I did the IRP at Vanderbilt and did, did the fellowship and in a couple of years as an instructor, then eventually got my own lab. I'll just reflect briefly there to say that like, I'm, I'm not a big fan of fast tracking. It took me like, you know, four years of PhD and like four or five extra years of research training before I was ready to open my own lab. And I don't think the time frame's gotten any shorter. So I think if you're a serious physician scientist candidate, you're probably going to need more time, not less time uh, overall, though it's attractive that that program uh, still exists. And I got my own lab and I've been running that since then. I'll say, you know, in the last year, we now have an immunotherapy for type 1 diabetes program in the clinic at Vanderbilt, as do many other places around the country, as immunotherapy for type 1 diabetes is finally a reality. So it's been really fun to watch that journey over the last 30 odd or 50, almost 50 years for me as a person. And 30 years as a scientist. Yeah, that was that was an awesome story. And thank you um, for all the panelists and for all your answers. Uh, I think that we will now transition to the second half of the webinar, uh, which will um, also include the rest of our panelists that we have here uh, to introduce uh, your specific programs uh, to the um, audience here. Um, and I believe that Alex has uh, compiled the PowerPoints that have been submitted. Um, and we will then have another short Q&A after that. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Jenny. Uh, so before we begin, I would like to invite our program representatives to give a short presentation of the programs in five minutes. And then we will take questions after all the presentations. Uh, attendees, you can, however, leave your questions in the chat as we go, as you've been doing it so far. Uh, we also encourage the programs to make use of the chat to answer any questions they can in case we run out of time. Uh, at 30 seconds remaining, I will notify the presenters with this ringtone. Uh, all right, so we can begin. Perfect. Our first program of the evening is Baylor College of Medicine. I would like to invite your representative to unmute and tell us about your program. Thank you. So uh, again, I'm Audra. I am the chief resident for the pediatrician scientist program. So I'm currently in my third and final year of the program. Uh, our program is a participant in the integrated research pathway, so it involves uh, two years of clinical time, uh, mostly uh, two years, and then the third year is majority research time. Um, the way that we have it split up is uh, to truly make it integrated, we have some research time dedicated in the first year as well. Um, which I already alluded to, so that uh, research block in the first year for two weeks where you have dedicated didactics and then you also work on a case report. Uh, similarly, in the second year of the program, you have that longitudinal uh, curriculum in the uh, research uh, environment, this time writing a mock K proposal. And so the purpose of that is really to hone your ideas and hopefully serve as a foundation for the project that you plan to pursue during your third year of the program. And that actually goes through a mock review as well um, that you get to sit in on. 
And that experience, though intimidating, is actually uh, very useful. And so you get to hear specific feedback. And this is done with faculty members who sit on the scientific review committees for K grants. So it's it's really helpful exercise. Um, and so that that is the longitudinal curriculum for the second year. And then the third year that I'm currently in um, is 10 months of protected research time. And with the continuity clinic, uh, one uh, clinic week, uh, one clinic every other week, and that's according with the board requirements. And then we do one supervising month during this year as well, just to help prepare for fellowship. Um, I think one of the major strengths of our program is the mentorship that's provided throughout the process. And so uh, you have what's called the RIAC uh, committee or uh, Resident Ind Individualized Advisory Committee. And that committee is uh, formed by a primary research mentor, um, your case report mentor, um, an educational mentor, and then you also have your program directors and categorical program director present as well. And so we have these meetings a couple of times throughout the year and it is just really a great opportunity to get feedback and um, guidance because one of the challenges I find for being a pediatrician scientist trainee is like I mentioned during those first two years, your clinical demands can be uh, quite heavy. And so um, it's helpful to, have dedicated time to really focus on like, where am I heading? Am I reaching my goals? Uh, who else do I need to talk to? And um, making sure you're staying on track. And we also do, as you can see in these pictures, a lot of social activities together. So we have our retreat um, each year in the summertime and all uh, significant others and kids and family are invited. Um, and then we have uh, regular didactics throughout the year, which is a good time to catch up. And um, we also have a peer mentoring program as well. And so we do a lot of things together. Our, um, our group me is quite active and uh, we support each other. So uh, that's a brief overview of our program, but in our individual meetings I'm, and in the chat, I'm more than happy to answer other questions. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, our next program is Emory University. Okay, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Anne Sharudi and I am the Director of the Pediatric Residency Investigative Scholars at Emory Program, or PRIZE as we like to call it. Um, we are uh, affiliated with both Emory University as well as Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, which is the um, primary location where our residents do their clinical training. Um, we have a, um, a sort of a flexible um, program where there are a number of different tracks kind of depending on um, how much or, or little, I guess, research you wanna do. I think probably most of the people on this um, call are, are would lean towards the, um, the longer periods of research in their um, clinical training, but in general, um, and, and this is, we have a very similar, um, uh, on our website, we have a very similar sort of block diagram that uh, what Dr. Satlin showed from uh, the Duke program as well. So you can take a look at that there, but the general track or the categorical track, um, you can do those three months of uh, mentored research during a standard three-year residency. And that's, you know, doing research as part of your, um, uh, as part of your elective rotations. Then um, over here, well, actually, you probably can't see my pointer, but over on the right side, I'll talk about the integrated research pathway and the accelerated research pathway. These are exactly as has been um, described previously. Um, and so we support both residents who do um, both of those pathways. The majority of our residents in recent years have participated in integrated pathway. So they've wanted to kind of really have just more research training during a standard three-year residency. Um, as a part of um, the interviews, I'll just point out that we do have you meet with the um, potential fellowship program directors, um, because if you if you would opt to do the accelerated research pathway, that's something that, you know, you'd want to connect with them sooner rather than later. 
Um, but of course, we recognize, as has been said before, that you may change your mind, and and so you know you're you're um, definitely that's that's an that's open uh, as well, and it's something that you can um, discuss once you come to the program. The final um, program that we have is the R thirty eight. Emory PP Star program, which is um, joint between pathology and pediatrics. Um, and we're funded by the NHLBI um, for this program. And, and this is, um, it supports 12 to 18 months of mentored research and we do it over a four year. So the, the final year is an additional year that's majority research, but you will have done um, in the third year, we do about six months of research. And in the um, second year, about three months of research with nine months in that fourth year. And so this is, um, ten, we're, we're, we're relatively new to this program. We have um, our first uh, pediatrics resident who's an intern this year, who's, who's starting in it. Um, but it is, it's more geared towards folks who haven't had a lot of research experience previously and who want to Kind of really get that um, kind of postdoc type research experience and, and start in research. Perhaps they're kind of late bloomers. Um, so, but overall, all of these programs are integrated um, it, within the prize umbrella. And, um, you know, we work very hard to help you find a mentor that's right for you and a um, scholarship oversight committee that, that is a um, kind of mentoring, both career and scientific mentoring committee. Um, we have lots of check-ins, make sure everything is progressing. We have our, our, our program um, manager is actually a, an English PhD and she is really phenomenal um, for one-on-one uh, -on -one writing support and help with both abstracts, manuscripts, you know, grants, all, all of the like, and even fellowship personal statements. Um, we meet once a month uh, and, and we do cover sort of lot, many different topics related to research and career development. Um, and then we do have a specific uh, grant opportunity for residents um, only, and we have some resources for financial support and um, for travel to conferences, et cetera. Um, I'll just mention that we're we're integrated within, you know, we sort of have a strong connection with the MD-PhD program. I used to be one of the associate directors. And then on the other side of that, we have a... Um, we have one of the um, NICHD funded K-12 programs, so Child Health Career Development Research Program, so uh, research award. So um, we try to sort of facilitate the vertical integration from the MD-PhD program to the PSD, through the PSDP and then to the K-12. So I'll just stop there and happy to take questions. Thank you so much. Um, our next program is uh, Icahn School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. So um, thanks so much. So um, <clears throat> we have a, a physician scientist residency track, um, which um, is very individualized based on the um, applicant or whoever um, gets in. Um, we support both um, consider late bloomers um, uh, as well as MD PhDs um, for the research residency. <clears throat> we um, offer the um, accelerated research pathway, um, but more importantly, again, we really individualize the curriculum um, based on the trainee. And I do wanna just um, comment um, what we have been able to do with that. Um, we, when we started the program, um, I, I had been, uh, before I was chair of the Department of Peds, I had been the MD PhD program director. Um, and a good number of our um, MD PhD graduates were going into Peds. One of them wanted to join our program, and she was the guinea pig for this research residency track. Um, somebody mentioned this that, you know, your fourth year of medical school, you have a lot of downtime. So as a new chair, I started a program where um, medical MD PhDs from Sinai, who um, uh, basically once they put in their rank list in you know um, the winter, um, if they told me, I could not ask them, but if they told me that they were ranking us to match, um, and they were you know somebody who we really wanted, 
um, I um, started to, um, uh, I paid for support of a technician starting basically the day of the match list went in um, for um, the duration of their training as a resident. So we were one of our MD PhDs who stayed on with us, who got a, um, actually she got a grad student to work with her from day one of her, um, uh, the day after she graduated with her MD PhD. Um, she um, secured R01 funding during her third year of residency. And again, the way she was able to do this, we worked with the American Board of Pediatrics to um, give her a very individualized program that enabled her to do research, um, to spend three months doing research every year of her training. Um, and you know, she had her technician or her um, grad student working with her. So she made a lot of progress as a resident. Um, we've had, um, again, with our individualized approach, um, we've, and our ability to encourage these really outstanding trainees to um, uh, you know, do good work during their um, training, again, with the support of a technician. Another one of our trainees got an NIH uh, Director's Early Independence Award, and one of our current PGY3s um, uh, just got a Thrasher Early Career Award. So I'm really trying to push for early um, grant funding um, the way we can do that for a PhD is they can get a faculty appointment um, in a basic science department, which enables them to apply for an R01, because clearly you can't get a K and be a, re a research resident. So right now we have six um, research residents um, in, our, in our three years, two, we take two each years, two each year through a separate NRMP. However, if there's a categorical um, resident who comes in who has had a lot of research experience and then decides in the second year that they want to do a, be a research resident, um, they we will meet with them and put them in this track um, if they're deemed appropriate. Um, we um, again have an NHLBI um, uh, star program now, um, also for our residents. So. Um, this is, I, we do everything, you know, I think that everyone else offered, but I do want to stress that we really work with each one of the trainees to individualize um, their training program to maximize their ability to accomplish research. So that's all I'll say. I'm start, stopping early. <laughs> Thank you so much. Our next program of the evening is Stanford University. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me and all of us tonight. My name is Carrie Rosbach, and I am the Pediatrics Residency Program Director at Stanford. And I have the pleasure of working with our amazing physician scientist residents and with many of the program leaders who are on this call tonight. We're part of a national collaborative, so we're all working together to try to meet the needs of our physician scientist train, trainees and continue to develop the pipeline. So um, what I can share about our program, first of all, you can see our current physician scientist trainees, their pictures are very small at the bottom of my slide. And then some of our faculty leaders are um, over on the left, um, also near the bottom. We have a separate match for our physician scientist training program. So we have four positions a year. We do occasionally take um, someone in addition to that, um, but, but generally four positions a year. And we do offer all of the American Board of Pediatrics pathways, including the um, IRP, ARP, and we do have a R38 STAR program as well. And we have a dedicated physician scientist advisor who is Zach Sellers, and he's listed there with the tie. And um, he is a graduate of our physician scientist training program and then completed a GI fellowship. And he's an independently funded investigator now and loves to mentor residents. We also have a scholarly concentrations program, which is for all of our residents, not just our research track residents. And um, our physician scientist residents can choose from one of a number of scholarly concentrations, although they almost all choose our basic and translational science scholarly concentration, which is led by Trung Pham, who's there, um, the far left picture, and then Anna Gloin, who's just to the right of him. And they are our leaders for the scholarly concentrations program and do quite a bit of mentoring for our 
um, residents in in their their research as well. Um, they oversee our scholarship oversight committees, which occur throughout um, PGY two through three years for our residents and help think through research and, and career goals and how we can help get our residents there. Um, we do have some grants that are offered that our, our physician scientist residents can apply for to provide some funding during residency, and that also includes travel funding. Um, we have a coaching program, which is for all of our residents, but provides a lot of good support for our physician scientist residents. And we have some other things within our program um, that help um, provide support and balance to our residents' um, busy schedules. And um, we have done some work around visas and trying to support international medical graduates. And so we currently offer J-1 visas and we're also working on um, expanding access to H-1B visas. Um, in terms of applicants, we take folks um, with a variety of backgrounds, including um, MD, PhDs, DO, PhDs, and then other MDs and DOs with significant research experience. And I just listed here some of our um, prior successes. So we've, we train a lot of uh, physician scientists and not all of them come through our research training program. Some of them come into our combined programs because we do also have um, several combined programs, including child neurology, peds anesthesia, peds genetics, and a triple board program. And within the last um, six years or so, we uh, began a Bridge to K program, which has been a really big success for um, our department in helping bridge people after fellowship into um, careers, once uh, helping them to get their K awards and then um, get into faculty positions. So I um, want to highlight that as something that we have learned that our physician scientist trainees um, need and benefit from. So thank you so much for having me and I welcome any questions during the Q&A. Thank you so much. Our next program is Washington University in San Luis. Thanks, Alex. And hi, everybody. My name is David Hunstad, one of the directors of the Pediatric Physician Scientist Training Program at WashU and St. Louis Children's Hospital. Um, and once again, uh, thanks to uh, Jose and Alex and Jenny for, for having us on. And it's good to see my fellow program directors on the call as well. So we um, have had our formal physician scientist training program now for 12 years, although WashU is a very heavily physician scientist oriented place um, across all of the departments, um, including medicine and pediatrics and pathology. Um, and our program is built um, as a six year program uh, that's combined residency and fellowship. Um, we do encourage people, but don't require people to uh, think about the ABP Accelerated Research Pathway. So of the people who have participated in our program over the last 12 years, about 60% do um, choose that pathway. And so they are getting um, to fellowship the clinical year by year three, and they're getting um, three years of research under their belts um, by the end of year six in most of the subspecialties. Um, our campus, uh, which you can see in a tiny picture on the left there, um, covers about 18 city blocks. Um, it's all contiguous, so you don't have to, you know, uh, shuttle back and forth, if you will, between uh, the Children's Hospital and uh, whatever research uh, facility you're in. And you really have access to any mentor as a primary mentor or on your committee uh, in any lab at WashU. So there's about six or 700 wet labs on the campus and you really can look across all the departments um, for the mentor and the lab that you want to do your research in. We have a, a thorough process by which we um, help you think about that and, and um, shortlist some mentors to go and meet with and meet with their labs, get a feel for what they do and the mentoring style and the vibe and the chemistry in the lab as well as the scientific projects that they're doing. Um, we offer discretionary spending funds um, in the early years and then a $10,000 salary supplement um, to the normal fellow salaries in the out years, four, five, and six. Um, and I want to echo something that Carrie mentioned just a minute ago, which is, you know, most people who are going to go on to individual K awards, um, even if they're MD, PhDs and have significant research success in the past, you know, the median number of years in your mentor's lab as a postdoc fellow is four before you're, um, you know, getting your K. So you really need to be thinking about, okay, when I'm done with fellowship and I have two years under my belt, 
in the lab, um, if I'm on a standard track or three years uh, on a research track, um, you know, I might not have my K in hand there. So um, you really want to be asking at programs how they support those early faculty years. Um, and we have, um, like you've heard, um, one of these K-12 Child Health Research Center grants and other mechanisms so that we guarantee support in those faculty, early faculty years while you're writing your K and getting that funded. We do have a very high K-8 success rate, 92%. Um, you heard a little bit about the national averages there. And our K to R transition rate is 61% um, compared to a national average of 40% for, for MD, PhD. So we know how to get Ks uh, and we know how to get people uh, launched. Um, let's put it that way. Um, I am pleased to run this program with my colleague, Tony French. He and I have been together at this institution for quite a while. Um, and he happens to be um, the chief of rheumatology and immunology, and I happen to be the ID chief. We also do have an R38 program from NIAID in infectious diseases and immunology. Um, and we have a lot of interaction with PSTPs in medicine and pathology, neurology, um, and emergency medicine uh, on the campus, as well as a very large MSTP uh, on our campus. The last thing I'll say about our program is that um, this will be the first year that we have a separate um, listing in the match for our research track. We're looking to take um, four um, research track residents, um, but we do encourage people who are interested to apply to both um, uh, because occasionally we'll pull somebody who's matched categorically um, over to the research side as well. And we want people to have the option uh, to transition over after they've arrived. I'll stop there and once again, happy to take questions um, afterwards and I'm easy to find on the internet. So please reach out by email with questions. Thank you so much. Uh, our next program is University of Pittsburgh. Yeah, hi, once again, I'm Andy Nowak. I'm the uh, uh, both uh, the main program director in Pittsburgh and I also co-direct our scientist track with um, my colleague, Mushmi Malik. Um, I'm going to um, repeat a lot of things that you've heard in the other categories, um, uh, just to highlight where we have some similarities with the others. Just like uh, Dr. Hunstad, who I'm following, um, our approach to our program is a six-year uh, approach with guaranteed fellowship entry at, uh, at onset. Um, you know, we have um, 18 different uh, pediatric fellowships, so a broad range of different fellowships to offer for trainees who come in the front door. Um, in terms of tracks that we support, we support them all. Um, we've, uh, we've had folks do ARP, we've had folks do IRP, um, and we've also had folks do kind of what we call categorical plus, where they um, modify a categorical residency to include um, some extra research time. Um, we've been able to do this because of support from the department, which has been critical for um, support of our program for things like travel funds and retreats um, and um, even, you know, uh, uh, publication fees, which is always very helpful. Um, but we also, like others, have an NIH uh, R38 program, um, which just got renewed this through NHLBI. And then we have one of the Burroughs Welcome Fund Scientist Incubator uh, programs. So um, both the R38 and the Scientist Incubator really have been great for us to recruit MD PhDs as well as MDs and DOs um, to our program who have significant research experience. Um, particularly, we've had a lot of success using those programs for uh, data scientists. Um, we have a very strong connection to CMU and um, the tech environment in Pittsburgh, which is very helpful. Uh, we currently have 17 trainees over six spread over the six years. Um, we have four slots for per year, and in our year individual years have anywhere between two to four folks in them. Um, and our our uh, our mission, which is developing folks through an individualized program, has produced a really strong community of scientists. And I think that's, to be honest, very um, common to all of the the programs that you're hearing from today. Um, and we supplement our program with um, a, a educational curriculum that includes a, a six year kind of seminar series, a leadership development academy. Um, and then and grant writing support and and uh, small uh, small groups for grant writing as well to support our folks. We are one of the younger programs, I think, today. We, we just started in 2016 officially. Um, we have our first five graduates out there, two of whom have K-08s, um, two of whom were supported on our departmental K-12, which also has been a big help, um, and then one of whom has um, uh, just been awarded a large community grant in Pittsburgh. So um, we'd invite you to come see us. I'm going to stop there and pass it on to the next person. Thank you so much. Our next program is University of California, San Francisco. 
Um, hi again. I don't. Uh, oh, you can go to the next slide. I um. Do you have? Oh yeah, there you go. Um, I don't have much to add beyond what everybody else said. Uh, we do have a separate match of three or four spots, depends on the year, and because we also have a combined peach genetic spot, so sometimes that takes the fourth spot. And we support the different alternative pathways. I will say our experience is very similar to St. Louis. The majority do accelerated. We ever so rarely, maybe twice in the last 20 years, have an integrated. Um, and most people, which is apparently unique, it seems like in most of the programs, it seems to be integrated. For our, our residents choose to include that extra research year as part of their fellowship, so as part of a postdoc. We give them the choice, but m most seem to do it. I think a lot of people come to UCSF because they're interested in, in being accelerated. As far as specific curriculum, we have a cohorted elective, a one-month elective, where they all are together for the, the different years, and we have different seminars focused on emerging science, professional, and career development. But really, the focus is on a helping them decide what they want to do for fellowship, what kind of research they want to do, and establishing um, structured mentorship for them. Um, I think I will actually um, stop there. OK, thank you so much. Our next program is University of North Carolina. Hi, I'm Corinne Keat, and um, with Misty Good, uh, we lead the pediatric uh, re residency PSTP. We also lead the fellowship PSTP, and we offer a variety of different pathways um, tailored to different people's interests. Um, so both the accelerated research pathway and an integrated pathway. The integrated pathway, um, both of them are you know characterized by individualized pathways. Um, but the integrated pathway, uh, we have a curriculum that goes through the fellowship that includes grant writing. We have protected research time, as many of the other programs have, um, travel stipends, and opportunities for departmental funding of research, uh, as well as uh, individualized committees. And I think, um, you know, what, one of the strengths of our program is we have a really wide uh, opportunities at UNC, including not just in basic sciences where there are many different labs available, but also a very strong school of public health with opportunities for international work as well as um, you know, local work and uh, very strong programs and in, in outcomes, uh, research outcomes. So, you know, thinking broadly about what uh, research is in pediatrics, um, as well as having a a great culture at UNC um, in all of the residency and fellowship programs. So I welcome uh, any questions and we look forward to talking to you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, our last program is Vanderbilt University. All right. Well, I, I think I'm just going to use most of my time to, to say something that Andy had said already is that like all the programs here are excellent and you can kind of see there's not that many ways to slice this up. There's only a handful of ways to really do this. So we're all basically saying the same thing over and over, but hopefully everyone appreciates it. Like all these the programs, at least the ones that are here, all set aside their evening tonight to come and hang out with you because they really are excited about uh, training you. Vanderbilt, uh, of course, included in that. Uh, too. So you know, we have fellowships in all the areas. We'll try to get you interviewing with the people that you might ultimately match with. We understand that you might change your mind. So we try to make a good assessment of you. I will say we, we don't have a six-year program. We have a lifetime program. So we're trying to commit to you from residency till death uh, so that you know you will be here getting full support as a resident, a fellow, a faculty member, an emeritus faculty uh, member. You know That's what our dream is, is to bring you in and, and help you build our program and help you build your program. Um, we're one campus like uh, WashU is, who you can walk anywhere on the campus within 15 or so minutes. So you can work in any of the hundreds and hundreds of labs that are here and any of the schools that are here. We've done engineering. We've done palliative care. We've done all kinds of things for our physician scientists. We have a great track record. Vanderbilt's super hot place to live. Nashville, you know, property values keep going up, so you probably can't afford to live here for much longer. So get here while you still can, and we'd be happy to have you. Thank you so much. Uh, that concludes this portion. Now we will open up the floor for a live Q&A. Hi, everyone.
Alex, do you want us to answer some of the questions that are in the Q&A section? Oh, yeah, I was um, reading right now. Okay, so on the topic of mentorship, what is your advice for cultivating relationships with both research mentors and clinical mentors? I guess okay, I'll just I'll, jump in. Oh, I'll go ahead. <laughs> we yeah. were all we were all waiting. Um, I would say in pediatrics, you pretty much just have to ask. Uh, we are all really excited about folks that are interested in in science and in our area of clinical interest. I'm a pediatric infectious disease physician, and we want everyone to go into pediatric infectious diseases, and <laughs> we will be very enthusiastic about it. So. Um, you know, once you kind of make a connection with someone, I think the word cultivating is really great, you know, stay in touch with them, you know, to keep them apprised of your accomplishments, you know, your questions that you have, um, you know, just kind of keep that thread going, whether you're on, uh, uh, and, and we all recognize that you guys are busy um, in medical school, as well as in residency, and, and we are as well. So, um, I think the, the key is really to just take that um, start, start the conversation and then, you know, play a role in keeping the thread go going and, and maybe just, you know, meet for a quick, a quick coffee or, you know, some, go to their clinic, do something that or visit the lab. But it doesn't have to be sort of this long drawn out, um, you know, uh, interaction every single time. And I think that that you'll find that that people are, are more than willing to um, chat with you about you know, all aspects of, of their life as a pediatric physician scientist. You know, just to add to that, I mean, I feel like a lot of the trainees just, they wait, they wait for like this perfect moment or this perfect thing to happen, or they are going to get their paper or their grant, and then they'll talk to you about it then. Right. But I mean, I think the idea is to like really be actively engaged in getting mentorship, like mentors are in peds in particular excited to talk to you, like set up the next meeting. You know, if you have an SOC set it up even if you don't know you're going to be ready for it just go and talk about your science and talk about your adventure if you have one-on-one -on -one mentoring set up the next time you're going to go do it and don't wait for a special occasion uh, to have the meeting just just have it because that's what cultivating the relationship is and then people can be really engaged and excited about what you're doing those are great answers thank you so much uh the next question says uh, what advice will you share to applicants to help them decide which places to apply to and which places to rank? I um, I just wanted to jump in from the perspective of someone who applied not that long ago. And um, as you can see, based on this uh, panel that we have, um, it is really good to hear the perspectives from different programs and different program directors. There are not that many, relatively speaking, especially as compared to internal medicine and other um, specialties, there's not that many uh, dedicated pediatrician scientist programs. And so I think it's beneficial to network and meet with people and see what their program's about, meet with researchers, um, this is your future. And so uh, getting that exposure is helpful. Um, that being said, um, you know, I think a lot of it comes down to your personal preferences. So all of us also have, you know, geographical factors, family factors, lots of other things, but you're not going to be able to really flesh that out unless you meet with people and talk with them. So uh, I recommend exploring various options. Yeah, just to piggyback, Audra, on what one of the things you just said, one of the questions that I ask applicants, every, pretty much every one I meet with, is not what you're going to rank, but what when you when it comes time to make your list, what are the criteria or the features or the things that are going to be top of mind when you are making the list? And as Audra said, that might be a critical mass of researchers in an area you're interested in. It may be a geographic thing. It may be 
I loved the people that I talked to, right? Um, even virtually getting, uh, you know, the vibe of a place and, you know, getting that feeling that it's the right place for you. Maybe it's a family thing, a kid thing. It could be anything. And I don't, it doesn't, I'm not trying what it is. I'm telling people, you need to think about what the most important things are to you um, when it comes time to make that list. I would just, I um, springboard off of Dave and just say, you know, it's not about the program design. You've heard a lot of different program designs you can pick and choose. It's about the fit with the people, how you feel about the leadership. Um, you know, we would be happy if everyone who's on the call tonight stays in pediatric research. That would be a win for all of us. We'd all be really excited about that. We need all of you. Um, and we'd all like you to come to our programs, but ultimately that's up to you. You know, we're going to we're going to uh, put on a, a good presentation of what it's like to be at all of our programs and give you that information. And then, as Dave said, just use those priorities along the way. Don't you don't don't. I would say, I think a little further down the line, someone said, what about, uh, should I look for a specific research mentor? I wouldn't choose a program based on one research mentor that you're thinking about, the, because you're going to spend some time with that person later on. You're going to spend a lot of time with residents and attendings and program leadership all the time during your residency and fellowship. Weight that very heavily. You want to you want to know that those people you're working with in that track are going to be folks who make you feel comfortable and bring you into that community of science, which is going to sustain you during your training and is going to help you towards success. And in many programs, by the time you get to the lab, you know, if you're if you're targeting a program for one person that you want to work with, that person could have left by then. And so you really want a place if I'm interested in this area of oncology or whatever, you want a place with a critical mass and a sort of a robust community of people that you could could see yourself working with. And because even if you do end up with that one person you're thinking about, the people that are also in that area that are in collaborative meetings and other things are going to be an important part of what you get out of that experience. Thank you so much. Uh, our next question says, what is a red flag in clinical years? Do you mean literature percentiles and scoring or professional problems or something else? I can just answer that at our program, we, you know, there's not a very different criteria for the research candidates as there is for the categorical candidates. And we there, you know, you need to meet the same criteria you would for the categorical. So all of the, it's not one particular thing, but just making sure everybody wants to make sure that, you know, we all care about the patients most of all. That is great. As a third year medical student, what can you do to boost your application for these research residences? I think the answer maybe is not super complicated. Just be involved in research, right? Uh, get your story together, be able to sort of, I mean, what we're going to listen for, no matter how much you've been doing, is about the choices that you've made, what you got from them, why you made them, and how that informs what you want to do next. And it could be a very small amount of research that tells you, just really makes you certain you want to do more. It could be more research that makes you confident about specifically what you want to do. Uh, next, but I, I mean, I think you hear that from all the program directors here that we're all in the, the business of building a career with you, for you, like uh, in concert with you. And you, you just have to have a clear vision of where you are now and, and how we can help you get to the, the next place and tell us your story. I might also say enjoy third year. I mean, you know, focus on being, uh, learning to be a good third year student and, and a clinician. I, you know, there's a lot of awesome stuff that happens during third year. I wouldn't overthink it, dive in and enjoy all those rotations, um, you know, uh, and and in terms of, you know, what happens to you in terms of grades during third years, if you're worried about an individual grade or rotation, we we know how to sift through that data to figure out um, who's going to fit with the program. And we recognize, you know, um, have the span of grades at places, and we, we're very good at, at, at figuring those things out. So don't fear too much about that. I was going to say the same thing Andy did, just very strong, you know, uh, 
growing your clinical skills and having a strong foundation in clinical medicine before starting residency is great. And then I would encourage you to also keep up your relationships with, with your research mentors so that they can give you a strong recommendation as well. Um, I think we care more about your determination and your professionalism and your attitude and the fact that you're trying to do really good research than sort of the actual outcomes of your research at, at this level. So uh, we want someone who's eager to learn and be developed into physician scientist. Great answers. Uh, thank you. Are there special ways to ask for a waiver petitions for a PEDS research residency programs? It's interesting because I think we have more physician scientists doing away rotations now, at least that's what I've observed since we've um, gone to all virtual interviews. So I, I think they come in the same process as other visiting medical students. You can just go through the same um, process. Um, and I think if you're visiting at an institution, it's an opportunity to also reach out to anyone you want to meet with while you're there. So feel free to reach out to faculty or residents who you think you might have overlapping interests with and want to get to know. Yeah, I'll just echo that. I think the rotation looks the same itself, but while you're there, yes, figure out who the research, the, you know, the PSTP directors, the relevant fellowship directors, whoever it is that might help you um, network, get information about the programs that are available there, et cetera, while you're at another place doing, you know, clinical rotation X. Awesome, thank you. Uh, can you discuss the pros and cons of the ARP and IRP versus another research pathways, in particular in terms of trade-ups and considerations for time, salary, and preparation for a K award? I mean, these are all great programs, uh, and they all do, in some ways, the same thing. That since the ARP and the IRP are both going to end up giving you three years of research and other opportunities, if you put it in your categorical, I think the most we've ever managed to squeeze out for a categorical residence is about four or five months uh, of research. So it depends a little bit on how people are going to put it together. When I talk about it, I think it's just tools in your toolkit. Like, you know, I think you should have access to, to both of them, different programs, may have reasons they use one or the other. You should talk to them uh, about that. But, you know, your research might benefit from having three contiguous years. That might be really important to like how you're going to work and how maybe you work as an individual. ARP is great for you. Your program might benefit from having a gap, like getting started as a second year resident and then having time to accrue patient samples. Maybe someone's going to collect those for you. You're going to spend that IRP time getting IRBs done and getting things started. And then if you're going to collect samples for two years, you're going to analyze them when you're a fellow. So then you have like relatively longer to get your project done. IRP would make a lot of sense uh, for you. Or maybe you just want to get back to it sooner, just personally or professionally, uh, just because you know you're coming right off of something. So I, I think that there's not you know, great differences between those. We'll see if you dig into the technical logistics a little bit. Some programs do use the IRP because it's still covered by CME funds. So the time is paid for, where if you use the ARP, the, the funding for it's been functionally moved to the fellowship. So you probably do need to talk to the fellowship director, particularly if they haven't had an ARP resident before, so that they make sure that they and the department know that, uh, that that's where the monies are going to have to come from later on. So some smaller programs don't know that and have been caught up in problems around that when the funding has been shifted from the residency to the fellowship because those funds that normally support residencies go away. So that sometimes makes the IRP easier for certain sizes of programs to administer. I think the real determining factor is what kind of research project you're doing. So there's a lot of projects that, you know, as Daniel was saying, lend themselves well to, you know, long, longer, continuous time of research. This is why in our program, we have most people do the ARP rather than the IRP. But I think there are certain types of research projects that would lend themselves well to IRP. And and either way, once again, you're getting roughly three years of research time in a six-year period. So um, it's really about what it is on a research side you plan to do and and sort of what makes sense. For most wet projects, you know, doing IRP doesn't work great because there's ramp up time and there's ramp down time. And it's not the most efficient way to, to get a lot done. 
Um, but once again, I think many of the programs you heard here tonight will consider either of them on an individualized basis. And I would just add one other thing um, just to think about is the, um, for the IRP, you know, I tend to think about those are the um, folks who can't fathom being away from the lab for three years, you know, which is what they, you would do after you leave MD, PhD, and, and maybe actually more than three years because you're doing your clinical training at the end of the MD, PhD. Um, and, and it, and even as, as, uh, David said, not even just being away from the lab, but being away from research, because it can be, um, it's more than just bench research that is supported in, in all these programs. So, um, you do, depending on your fellowship, you know, even if you do the IRP, you're then going to get most likely, um, two years of research time in, at the end of your fellowship. So, um, you know, it, it's, I think everybody kind of approaches it differently. Um, and one thing to think about, I know that when I was in training, um, this is a while ago, but I, I still hear this occasionally, there are some fellowship programs that think if you haven't done a third year of residency and sort of led the team and sort of been the, um, some, the person who's, um, in, you know, quote unquote, in charge of, of the, the patient and the workload that you may not be as good of a clinical fellow. Um, and so that's just something to think about as well. It may be, it may be a myth um, and it may be, it's very individualized, but I think that is also a good question to ask depending on what fellowship you want to go into. And I tell our trainees the same thing. Some of our fellowship directors have very strong opinions about whether residents should do IRP or ARP. So we do encourage our residents to get their support from their, you know, future fellowship director, hopefully, um, you know, depending on which track they want to go on. The other thing I talk about is sort of the intensity of the training, because it is important to know that if you fast track through the ARP, it is a pretty intensive two years of clinical, and then you go straight into another busy year of um, clinical training in fellowship. And we have had some residents tell us they didn't realize how challenging that would be. And um, so the advantage of the IRP is it does give you a little bit of um, breaking up of some of the clinical intensity in there. But obviously the trade-off is is having probably less time at the back end of, um, in, of uh, research stretch. So pros and cons to both approaches. And we we personally tell our residents we'll support them either way. And it's an individualized decision. Thank you so much. Uh, since many of the mentioned grants require US citizenship, such as K award for at the end of training, what will you recommend to IMGs interested in research during residency? If you have any IMGs in your program, how do you support them in terms of getting outside grants? Well, I'll just thing. mention, oh, sorry, oh, I'll just mention yeah. one thing, and I, I don't have a, um, I think David probably has more experience with this, but just there is one K grant that does not require you to be a U.S. citizen, and it's a very coveted grant, which is the K99 R00. So that's highly competitive, um, but it is a, a very good option to be thinking about um, for for all U.S. Uh, non-U.S. citizens. And I, for one, would hope that they at some point would relax that um, restriction because it seems very silly to me personally. Yeah, and there are some foundation grants as well that mm -hmm. you know one can apply for the American Heart Association and others, PKD Foundation. And maybe some bigger ones. I don't know the rules for things like Burroughs Welcomes and, and that, yeah. but there are, you know, foundations and agencies that don't have that restriction. And then, you know, if you are thinking about it long enough in advance, you know, we just had a an IMG that that was a visa holder when he came to us, but by the time it was actually time to get a K, you know, he had gone through various other processes and had applied for a green card. And, you know, by the time he was writing a K, he was eligible. So I think there's some planning, you know, looking ahead and saying, okay, five years from now, I'm going to do that. Uh, and, you know, start working on what you have to do to get to that, to get to that permanent residency um, if a K is, is something that you want.
Awesome. Thank you. What's the best way for MD, PhD students to make use of all the free time in M4? Do a mini postdoc, wrap up loose PhD ants? So I'll weigh in here. I think the best thing to do is finish papers, do research. You really have so much time, you know, between putting in your match list and starting your residency. Um, so try to get as much research done as you can, um, you know, at the at the bench, if you're a bench researcher or whatever, because once you start your clinical time, you're not going to have that um, you won't have the time to work on at the bench, but you may have time to write. I'm a, I'm a big fan of that. I mean, I think you start working in that spring and papers come out the next fall and the next year. Papers don't come out right away, right? And so that then gives you a longer period of productivity because you shut down stuff at the end of graduate school and then don't start again till fellowship. You may have a four or five year gap in your productivity and, and K committees do sometimes comment on this. Not every reviewer is knowledgeable about MD, PhD and residency training. They just looking for a year after year of things coming out. So, you know, you get the chance to finish stuff and get it out there and safeguard yourself against that and make your mentors happy that stuff got completed and make you feel happy that it got out there. I think it's a really good, you know, good use of your time to tie it up, to hand it off to someone, to write out a plan for what the next person uh, should do to make sure that your work gets finished. Yeah, I think you want to, you want to finish up things, especially if you can do it in the fall, like during application season, that makes your application stronger. If you can actually get a paper submitted or accepted that's been sitting there for a little while, um, and you can let your, you know, the programs that you're applying to know that that's happening. Um, and then I think if you have free time in the spring after match, you can equally finish up things. You can start learning more about the research environment uh, at the place that you've just matched in. And honestly, I tell people to not forget to go on vacation uh, for a couple of weeks uh, because it's one of the last times you have a chunk of time where you can really, you know, think about your, you know, age 26, 30 bucket list and think about, you know, just, you know, uh, getting away for a little bit before you start, not for a month or six months, but take a couple of weeks and, and, uh, you know, get a brain break and check something off your bucket list. Concur with David. <laughs> and, and get sleep. But stock up on your sleep before starting to intern year. The, uh, the other reason to wrap up uh, papers from your PhD is it also becomes a lot more challenging to get those papers completed once you start clinical duties, but also you'll lose access to a lot of the university privileges that you had as a medical student and PhD trainee. And so there's a lot of uh, administrative barriers as well. And so it just in your best interest to have kind of a clean slate when you start. Great. Now our last question of the evening is now that step one and complex level one are pass fail. Do you believe that research opportunities are more important to get during preclinical and clinical years? I, I don't think they're any more important. I mean, they're if you're applying to research tracks, you need to have a track record. And so, you know, I think that they're they're important. Um, you know, I have to, I mean, this is I don't think only an opinion shared by me. And the Standardized exams are standardized exams. They fortunately have been de-emphasized a bit because they don't predict a whole heck of a lot. And none of us are inviting you into our research tracks or our residency programs to have you take standardized tests every week as a measure of competence. You know, we're going to measure your competence in much more satisfying ways to you. So you should, I would engage in research because that's what you like to do. And, you know, and those longer term relationships, particularly when a, a mentor writes a passionate letter about you. I mean, that means the world to us because that's really the sorts of things we're going to want you to do in our program and, and have success with it. So, um, you know, they're they're important if you're applying to a research track. You know, uh, that sounds like a non sequitur, but it's true. Thank you so much. Um, now to 
end this uh, webinar session, what is a piece of advice that you will give uh, current students preparing for residencies? I would I would just say as you're preparing for residency and, and getting ready, you know, take take joy in all the parts of it. I wouldn't try to, you know, be focused on getting your research portfolio together during third year. Be a good third year student during third year um, and take advantage of the opportunities that come across across the way. Um, uh, that's going to build that's going to build what you need. We love to see great letters from research mentors, but. We need good letters from clinical mentors too, because you're going to do both clinical medicine and research in our programs. So um, have a wide variety of experiences. Try not to be unifocused because we're going to expect you to be, you know, um, diverse when you come into our programs and thrive in a lot of different areas. Yeah, and you're given a lot of, you know, good advice, you know, meet people, do your networking, get a lot of sleep, go on some vacations, eat some good food, know your city. Um, but I mean, I, th I think if you're trying to get advice, it's like the more you can know yourself as you come into these programs, the more we can help you. You know, the more you can articulate, what, what does it take to me for me to be successful? What kind of things make it so it's really difficult uh, for me? How, how can I best be helped uh, in this process? What are, what are my weaknesses? You know, are they very technical? Like, oh, I need a stats class. Are they more like uh, philosophical? Like I have trouble staying organized, you know? Like, and then how can we help you be successful? We, we see all these kinds of different people and we, we want everyone to stay in research. I think Andy and a couple others have said that before, like PEDS is not over-resourced in researchers and it's our job. Uh, I think it's our job to make sure that anyone that wants to do it gets the absolute best chance to succeed. Will everyone succeed? Unfortunately, probably not, but that's our role is to try to make sure that like we squeeze the last ounce of opportunity out of the universe to make sure that you can succeed and you can help us with that by sort of being able to say like, this is what I need. This is what will make me successful. And then we can answer your questions about how we're gonna provide that. And so that will help you make a really good match. I am, um, as someone who, went through the match process not too long ago. I I think it's important to remember that it truly is a match process. And so just as much as you are being interviewed, you are interviewing the program as well. And we do call it recruitment because you are being recruited. And so keep that in mind and, and hopefully that eases some of the anxieties around um, the process and just have fun with it. And um, it's fun to think about your, you know, the possibilities for your future and uh, meet people and yeah, enjoy it. Great. Thank you so much. Jose, do you want to? finish the session. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just want to thank everyone for coming out and getting um, all their uh, questions answered. Uh, of course, to all of our panelists and co-hosts and organizations for uh, rallying the folks uh, who are on the call. Um, APSA will go ahead and send out uh, the slides um, and panelist bios uh, if folks uh, want to contact uh, individuals. Their emails are public on the websites that they posted. Um, and uh, we'll see you then. So again, thank you all for coming. Um, good luck on the match and uh, see you on the interview trail. Yeah, for those who are playing. Sounds great. Thanks, everybody. Good luck, everybody.